art in an age of reconstruction. We cannot determine all the conditions which came together to produce such periods of artistic profusion as were the Golden Age of Athens, the Quattrocento in Italy, the Tudor period in England. But, bearing in mind the identification of the creative impulse with the enduring values in human life, the spiritual and emotional, as well as the intellectual vitality of a people, this much may be certainly affirmed that any form or kind of art requires of society that it shall possess a certain community of belief, a staunch and unified front to life, that people shall be linked by some common tenets, that their thought and their feeling and their belief shall have found some synthesis, some proportional balance. There must be values binding a people together, otherwise the artist has nothing to work on no means of communication. There have been periods of upset and turmoil, periods, as they are called, of transition or of decadence when the prerequisites which buttress the artist have been absent. There has been a wasteland with one or two voices, still and small, crying in the wilderness. Such was the period of the barbarian invasion of the Roman Empire and the period in English poetry between Chaucer and the Elizabethan dawn. Europe would seem to have undergone such a time in the years following the World War. Reconstruction is now underway, with what prospects for art we shall next consider. Post-war confusion that withers belief. The World War, which shattered so many of our beliefs, had the effect at the same time of sending civilization further forward than it would normally have gone in several generations. The result is that most of us, and the post-war generation is not exempt, are living in a world to which we cannot adjust ourselves. It is rather as though we had climbed into Wells' time machine and had been translated into a future age, bearing our pre-war background with us. We still believe in things which are dead, or we would persuade ourselves we believe. Alternately, faced with the problems of modern life, we turn aside, give ourselves up to the circus of machine-age diversion, to the blaring accompaniment of the brazen voice, I am the Calliope, 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 hoot toot, hoot toot, hoot toot, hoot toot, willy 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 wahoo, says fizz. And we believe in nothing at all. What has this got to do with art? A great deal, because, as we have said, art requires for its creation and its communication that there should be cohesion in its material, that there should be latent in life what Michelangelo divined in the rough-hewn block of stone, that intuition of the finished work to be. The artist must perceive the same prefigurement in the spirit of the age. He can make nothing of hollow men, he can communicate nothing to them. Nor is this only the case with literature, one has only to think of the impetus given to painting and sculpture and architecture, as well as to poetry by the Renaissance, which was, in fact, a renaissance of man's belief in himself and in the delight of living. The Middle Ages, murky though they were, cluttered with superstition, the sources of knowledge damned by dogma, themselves provide an example wretchedly stunted and cramped as was the physical and intellectual life of those times, yet the people as a whole possessed a spiritual vitality without which it would have been impossible for their cathedrals to have risen in such magnificent forms towards a haven beyond this world. The first ardour of the communist regime in Russia might also be mentioned for the masterpieces of Einstein and Podovkin. The problem today is to find this driving force, this zest, this unity, which provides the impulse to art. The machine age has come upon us with the rattle and roar of its engines. We are trying to recover from our bewilderment, to readjust ourselves. A problem faces the artist. To take a modern illustration, everybody knows that for the voice of the radio announcer to be reconstructed out of the vibrations it affects in the ether, in order that his message should come to us from our loudspeakers, contact must be made from an aerial and with the earth. In the same way, in order that the artist may communicate with us, he must first make contact with the spirit of the time, 
with the pulse of consciousness throbbing at the core of the age. Only then can the creative impulse operate strongly, without impediment. Art cannot be produced by the intellect alone, as has been abundantly proved in the post-war era, nor can one force feeling, as, for instance, some moderns have tried, who have played at being the wounded, raging, too often ranting D. H. Lawrence. Art cannot go back. It cannot fight science. It would only shatter itself to pieces in that attempt. Art today must accept science, create an expression which will include everything science has introduced into life. This, to some measure, has been accomplished, especially by architecture and the cinema. The partnership between science and art. It is too early to say much about the cinema as a form of art, because films which may be called great art have been few and far between. All that one would say at present is that the cinema, a medium born of the machine age itself, would appear to provide quite exceptional possibilities for the artistic expression of these times. It combines all the arts. It is far less exclusive than any of them. That is to say, it is within the reach, literally speaking, of everyone. Above all, the cinema is itself a machine. Science has here been accepted as a collaborator with art. The other medium of art in the West today, which would seem to have achieved a rebirth from the ruins affected by the World War, is architecture. The very speed, the drive towards efficiency and economy of space and time, the general acceleration brought about to a considerable degree by the war has tended to bring architecture close to the spirit of the times, to the current of the age's consciousness. The design of modern life no longer permits of such florid ugliness as characterised buildings of the Victorian period. To be sure, these continue to be built. Ugliness still abounds in our buildings, but modern architecture has to a large extent oriented itself. This adaptation to the spirit of the times is especially noticeable in the New World and in countries like Italy, Germany, Austria and Soviet Russia. In countries, that is, where the traditional regimes have been overthrown. And it must be said that revolutions, however adversely they may work upon the other arts, have sometimes undoubtedly been beneficial to architecture. During the last few years, entire towns have been built in Italy, on land reclaimed from swamps, and great industrial cities have sprung up in Russia on what was before uninhabited barren land. Colonies of working men's houses in Berlin and Vienna were erected as a direct consequence of social democracy, taking over power in these capitals after the war. These modern buildings, to a large extent, dictate their own form. 20th century speed sweeps them into clear spare lines, frees them from the useless decorative ugliness of Victorian forms. Beauty diffused into everyday lives. This new design, both created by and expressing modern life, is apparent in the crafts as much as in the arts. The advance has, of course, been due in the first place to changing conditions, dependent on the progress of scientific invention. We are not concerned here with old forms which persist. Ugly mahogany furniture, horsehair chairs, hideous art curtains and wallpapers, but with those forms which swiftly on some fronts, slowly on others, are more and more invading the domain of our everyday lives. Considered in this way, it may be said that the old conception of a craft, the conception of William Morris with his home beautiful, his handmade objects, his refusal to accept machinery and standardization, all this is not only impracticable, it was always that, but dead. And yet Morris's ideal that every man should have pleasant surroundings in which to live is actually nearer realization now in consequence of that very machinery, that very standardization Morris decried. Only machines and only specialization in industry can supply every man with pleasant, even with beautiful surroundings. 
an example of the change which has come over the form of objects which are primarily not works of art, but articles of use, may be found by comparing a motor car of the year 1900 with a motor car of today. Motor cars in the early period, though they possessed a kind of grotesque character, were ugly objects, gawky, stubborn-looking mulish. Today, they are graceful. Speed, which resulted from the mastery of science over the principles of the internal combustion engine and specialization, which perfected each separate part, have made a thing of beauty out of what was once a ramshackle adaptation of a horse carriage. Though motor cars, considered aesthetically, are far removed from the examples we have been discussing, we mention them as an illustration of what we have been chiefly concerned to point out in this introduction, the relation which art bears to life, in order to give a final familiar illustration of a point where this 20th century life, which has so much to do with machines, is finding expression in aesthetic form. Poetry, music, painting, though they would seem to have little affinity with a locomotive or a factory, must, all the same, if they are to be living expressions of modern life, draw their material and shape their form in accordance with the same forces which have created our vast power plants, skyscrapers and airliners.